Hi there Deep Notes, welcome to this video which is all about a Twitter space regarding the future of cross-chain. Now this is important to us because the future of Deep Network when it moves to Solana it's all going to be about crossing work and tasks and tokens all across different chains. Um, so Eric Ma makes an appearance, he was invited by MC Squared Fi or DeFi whatever, um, yeah MC Squared Fi and he chatted a little bit about it but this whole chat is really about how it all works in regards to cross-chain interactions. So I thought it was really important. Please enjoy and I'll chat at the end of it. Hello everyone. Can you properly hear me? Yes. That is awesome. Let's give it two more minutes to make sure everyone has connected. And I hope we have no problems. I mean, technical problems with X spaces today. I also wonder whether Chris joins us. Let me check. Give me a sec. All right. Hello and welcome everyone to our next episode of Spaces at MC Squared Finance. Today's topic is chain reaction, the future of cross chain. And let's start with a round of introductions. So in no particular order, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, Kirilla Yusuf. Hey, man, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, Tell us a bit about Coin Avatar, what it is, what's your role in it? Sure. So, Coin Avatar is like a multi chain platform which allows our, our users uh, to obtain new Bearing LSD assets. So, they're in the form of coins and fungible assets. So they do it by locking their cryptocurrency uh, or liquid staking token or liquid staking tokens. If, if, if briefly. Awesome. Uh, the next one is Sina, uh, uh, Chief Operations Officer at 21st Capital. Hey Sina, tell us a bit more about your project. Hey guys, uh, thanks for organizing this session. Uh, my name is Sina. I am a professor of business and the uh, co-founder of 21st Capital. Uh, 21st Capital mostly is focused on Bitcoin consulting and custody. Uh, we also publish research uh, in collaboration with Bitcoin News. And uh, you're welcome to take a look at our, our newsletter that has just been uh, released. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, next one would be Nick Watts. Hey, Nick. Uh, you are a BD lead at Dub Dub Me Up. Every time, uh, tell us a bit more about Dub Dub Me Up. What it is, how it functions. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for inviting us to be on the space today. Um, so yeah, my name is Nick. I lead BD for Dab Dab. Um, Dab Dab is a new product in the current DeFi landscape where we aggregate um, user interactions across a variety of like Ethereum layer twos. Um, within a single platform so users can essentially you know swap lend borrow bridge stake um, restake um, within a singular platform across 16 different chains and 160 different protocols um, so we deploy front ends for like all the main dexes all the main lending protocols bridges etc we essentially allow you to do everything DeFi in one place um, because of this front end um, separation between a smart contract Nice. And we have one more guest today, Eric Ma, uh, representing uh, Deeper Network. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? Tell us more about Deeper Network. Hey, everyone, how are you doing? So Deeper Network is a blockchain project, obviously. Uh, we're focused, we're deep in project, uh, decentralized infrastructure, physical network, physical infrastructure network. And we focus on uh, security. My cybersecurity and combine that with uh, privacy protection through our decentralized VPN and as well as mining. And through these three things, we're also able to uh, create a lot of other tools such as decentralized oracles. Uh, we have our own bridges. We're currently migrating from Polkadot over to Solana. So I found this particular um, X, our twi uh, Twitter space today uh, extra interesting so 
Thanks for having me. Awesome. And I represent MC Squared Finance. We offer a tool for digital portfolio analysis and also are going to release our copy trading features soon uh, so people in DeFi can actually get a treatment uh, previously seen only in centralized exchanges. And we are also planning to, uh, we are already doing it with cross-chain support so that it's nice and cozy in DeFi. Also, uh, we are expecting uh, one of the co-founders of MC Square Finance, Chris. Uh, he should be joining us in a few minutes. But let's start right now. So let's start with definitions. Uh, I'll be calling uh, a couple of speakers uh, for every talking point who, in my opinion, uh, are like most likely to be uh, like better representing that uh, talking point. But uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand and also provide extra comments on every talking point. So I'd like to start with Sina. So could you please uh, define what is cross-chain technology? Uh, just as uh, you would define it, let's say, in a, in a university. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically we have um, uh, isolated and separate blockchains that are operating and there's a lot of liquidity f flowing in these networks. And uh, uh, probably if you look at the bigger ones, a hundred different, more than hundreds of different networks uh, and they don't have an easy way to operate and interact with each other. Uh, the money that's that's working in one environment is does not have an easy way to transition to the other network, and that limits the ability for uh, a lot of financial services and applications, and essentially limits the network effects. So, if we are able to develop technologies that enable transition of value between these networks. Uh, that's uh, going to that's going to be a game changer and, and lift a lot of these limitations. I improve the liquidity across the networks and also improve usability. So remember, network effects is 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 a factor is a force that defines the value of a network as the number of uh, its users increase. In financial networks like blockchains or any any uh, you know tradable token that we are talking about, the value comes from other people that are able to use it, right? So if you expand the usability of a network through um, a cross-chain technology, then you have also improved the network effect of each of these uh, networks. So uh, this is essentially a way for us to deal with the isolation and separation that exists between different blockchains. Thank you, Sina. Nick, how do you feel about such definition or would you like to like uh, add on something to it? Um, no, I think that was a pretty good, well-rounded start awesome. with Amir, Eric. Awesome. Yeah. I'm... Oh, sorry. No, no, Did no. I say something to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, if if somebody would like to add something to the definition, or maybe you have some different, then you totally enlighten us. No, I think that was a excellent yeah, um, I definition. But I I do have a couple of things because um, Cena mostly focused on liquidity and and money, which is you know probably at the top of our a, a lot of the crypto traders and people in blockchain uh, as a priority. But I think. The cross-chain technology also uh, is not only about liquidity and money, but also, um, you know, about the data on how to transfer different information when you're migrating from one chain to the other, uh, how the the nodes work and all the little details. Um, and, and a lot of times blockchains work differently. So um, you have to change aspects of your project in order to migrate. And so the data that's actually transferred over so that uh, the chains can still continue to operate on a on a, a new chain is really important. Also, um, the functionality aspect, when you are, I think having bridges uh, across different uh, blockchains, a lot of times certain blockchains have certain advantages. And so by having these bridges, 
you are able to kind of uh, capture the strengths of different uh, blockchains. And then if the bridges are efficient, you can use those strengths together at the same time without any lag or, or delays. So I think that's really beneficial. Um, and one of the other things, a uh, huge issue in blockchain is the scalability aspect. So by having, by being able to use the strengths of each blockchain um, at the same time, a lot of times that could possibly solve scalability issues in the future. Uh, currently, I would say the bridges are not robust enough. It's still early. But uh, these are just some of the aspects I think we um, need to continue move forwarding on. Thank you so much, Eric, for your additions. Uh, I'd like to pause and tell everyone that Chris has just joined us. And uh, Chris is a co-founder of MC Squared Finance. Hey, Chris. How are you doing today? Hey, guys. Doing great. Okay. So as you've just joined us, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, how do you see the enter operability challenge uh, in uh, cross chain technology uh, huge huge like it's it's totally natural that uh, a system an ecosystem that is growing fast is starting to break out and specialize and that's what we see with the layer twos that you have a lot of layer twos which try to specialize in different areas and optimize for different scenarios so that's that's fully what happens with natural systems um, but the key thing for adaption of the user is that it should not hinder the, the usability. And I think that's the biggest challenge currently, that when you look into the space, users need to know what chain an asset is on and need to know what kind of risks they are getting into when they bridge to another chain. Is it a new one? Is it a big one? What is the liquidity of the new chain? Etc. And all these complexities will uh, is stopping us from getting to mass adoption of the chains, because like we will never go mass market if users actually have to think about what uh, chain and asset is on. And I think that's one of the big things. We also like we are working on with Ansysca Finance to drastically simplify the cross chain interoperability with intent based uh, strategy creation. Absolutely. I'd also like to remind all speakers that you can raise your hand if you have, you know, something to add on to the current uh, you know, question. Uh, if not, then I'd like to forward next question to Kirilla, uh, because uh, Kirilla is uh, like Kirilla's project, Coin Avatar, is specializing on uh, cross-chain yield. So, Kirilla, can you tell us a bit more uh, how various cross-chain protocols enable asset transfer? Yeah, so as far as from my understanding how it works right now, so yeah, so there are a lot of bridges which just exist currently on the market. Uh, yeah, so users can use these bridges in order to transfer one asset to another blockchain. So there are, uh, there are like bridges that are like uh, works as decentralized, uh, or in that there are some bridges that works like centralized. I mean, they like have like a backend stuff, yeah, so etc. Uh, so this is uh, what my understanding how it works. Thank you so much. Uh, also, yeah, I invite all our speakers to add on that. And uh, also, maybe let, let's continue, Kirilla. Tell me, uh, like, what's the impact on user experience, uh, for instance, when they do this th through bridges? Um, so basically, I will speak from my side as I'm also this kind of user. So this is... Um, uh, a little bit complicated because you have like a like a, a step, additional step that you need to do, uh, or, or and as if you are not a proficient user, yeah, you need to uh, you need to understand how it works. You need to understand, okay, so this blockchain, uh, I need to transfer uh, assets from this blockchain to another. How it works? Uh, uh, will I lose my money or will everything some something happen during this process? Yeah, so this is gives some sort of uncertainty. Plus. Uh, I need to uh, like pay some sort of commission in order to do that. Yeah, so, the, so for non-proficient user, it's, it will be super complicated. Uh, for proficient user, this is like a, just another an additional step which uh, which needs to be done, and it's not not so convenient. I would say that it will be much more easier if it will not terminate this step and do it like uh, like um, like bridge between uh, like. Uh, 
direct bridge between uh, two blockchains uh, without this additional uh, intermediate. Thank you so much, Nick. I knew you wanted to add something on this, so uh, but it's also helpful that you raised the hand, so please go on. Yeah, I mean, even touching on sort of bridges and, you know, interoperability um, blockers, I would say, currently in the market, you know, there are a variety of, you know, very established bridges and foundations that, you know, are working on like cross-chain transfer protocols and cross-chain messaging that, you know, enables uh, messaging between blockchains and networks. And I think ultimately, um, we're moving towards a world where, um, you know, I think you guys are mentioning intent-based, um, you know, things that you guys are working on. I think account abstraction and chain abstraction are two things that we'll really see come into fruition this year. Um, I know Nier is doing some cool things. I know other uh, foundations are working on a lot of things, but ultimately it's like, can you abstract away from knowing what network you're on and then using your assets um, to be able to transact in a variety of different networks and having that just be, you know, a very entirely seamless experience that um, hasn't really been experienced before. And um, I think there's um, a lot of people working on many different things. I mean, for us, namely, it's like you're on one place, one platform, be able to interact with, you know, a variety of different chains and a variety of different protocols. So um, I think ultimately everyone's just like, we understand networks are very siloed. Networks are uh, very tribalistic. You have a group of users on Solana, a group of users, I say, on Avalanche, whatever, whatever, right? Um, and including layer twos. And so it's like, let's break down these barriers, unify liquidity, and then make every chain much more interoperable and, and you know, a seamless experience between one another. Also, speaking of users, uh, Sina, I'd like to ask uh, whether uh, 21st Capital currently faces the challenge of uh, your, uh, let's say, clients uh, considering to use various chains, or are you just uh, working with only particular networks? Uh, yes, actually, uh, a lot of people have issues regarding dealing with multiple networks. Uh, um, first of all, you know, just learning about the intricacies and, and the good wallets to use, good practices in different networks is always a challenge for people. They may know quite a bit about one network and then sometimes they find that because of the advantages that were mentioned earlier in another network, they have to switch over and then they get themselves in trouble. Uh, we do help a lot of those clients. Uh, like one of the very common issues is, is is simply minimizing the transaction cost, the trans transaction fees. When, for example, let's say like it's a very simple case, you're withdrawing some Bitcoin uh, or Ethereum on a, uh, from an exchange. Uh, people naturally want to make sure that um, they're using the cheapest network and they sometimes have to hop on another network to do the transaction and then, you know, uh, switch to, to the original chain. Um, and that's a lot of work, a lot of complication. And if we know anything in finance, simplicity is the king. So people don't really want to know, deal with so many different transactions. Uh, as it was mentioned earlier, abstraction is key. User doesn't really care what kind of network they're, they're using, mostly. Um, but they only want the outcome and the, and the efficient and the efficiency, and they don't, they want to pay the minimum fees and all. So, uh, this is a big barrier. Like I said earlier, the isolation, the separation between the networks is, is kind of hindering all the activity. And if, if that is improved, improved upon, uh, the whole ecosystem gets just one level easier to use, makes the users happier and uh, reduces the, the hassle and complexity for them. Thank you so much. Uh, also, uh, let's now talk about the problem of security. Oh, Eric, you, actually, I wanted to forward next question to you, but perhaps you wanted to add something here, right? Yeah, I think um, everyone's got really good input on that, but I think we shouldn't be frustrated. Uh, it's a natural progression, I think we're currently um, on the right track towards uh, what um, that was just said regarding kind of a, a user not having to think about what network they're on and all that. Um, I think right now there's so many different chains and different projects so focused on building a quality blockchain that works 
properly. I mean, just look at Solana, right? Solana still faces uh, a lot of outages and, and these sort of things, but it's a good chain itself. But for them to start focusing on bridges and working with other blockchains and making sure that it's interoperable, um, you know, I don't think that's kind of the, the priority for them at the moment. I think they um, should focus on their chain and making sure that it's it's working seamlessly. So, um, so I think a lot of people are, you know, thinking like, well, how come we don't have that yet? How come we don't have bridges that, that make it so seamless and mass adoption and all that? I think the natural progression, again, is to focus and build solid blockchains and interoperability and all these kind of things will come later, uh, naturally. And there could be projects in the future that are solely uh, management of bridges or a collection of bridges that, that are able to, to, to help blockchains uh, work more seamlessly. And these are things that, that could pop up in the future. That is absolutely true. I have a friend who's been complaining about bridges for years on. Uh, now I'd like to address next question also to you, Eric. Uh, let's now speak about uh, the security considerations, especially since you deal, you know, uh, in that niche. So uh, addressing the security implications of cross-chain interactions, how to safeguard against potential vulnerabilities when you're dealing cross-chain? Well, um, as most of bridges, I think they're basically built uh, into smart contracts. So I think the cross-chain operations, because they rely so much on smart contracts, the, the bugs and the vulnerabilities in contracts uh, can easily be exploited. So we've probably heard a lot of bridges being hacked uh, it's usually hacked through these smart contracts and the liquidity and, and the money is, is basically drained out of it that way. So um, that leads to a lot of loss of funds and data breaches. So smart contract vulnerabilities is, is really uh, one of the main things that people have to, to focus on in order to, to make the security more robust. Um, relay and Oracle attacks about centralization. Uh, you know, like Link is probably one of the most popular oracles currently, but Link, I'm um, not, not trying to bash on Link, but if you actually look at the the structure of Link, they, you know, they have about 21 validators, uh, only 21. And uh, like, for instance, Deeper Network, we're building, uh, we've actually already built a decentralized oracle, which allows um, every device on our network. Right now we have over 175 different 175,000 different devices around the world that can each act as an oracle. And so to attack 175,000 nodes versus 21 nodes, which uh, carry a lot more weight um, because they're handling a lot more validations and stuff, um, it's a big difference. So decentralization, I think, is really key for a lot of these relay and oracle attacks that could happen um, between these bridges. And then also, um, I think that we talked about centralization, um, you know, having more validators, having uh, safer kind of um, less failure and increase uh, when, when there's more in increased attacks and how that would affect the network. Those are things that we have to keep continue to move towards is decentralization and distribution. I think humans right now, we still have a tendency to have uh, different aspects of centralization that we hold on to, but um, we have to kind of move away from that and release the control and let um, decentralization kind of happen. And um, and I think also we talk about different chains and how they can interact, but we don't realize how complex it could actually be. Um, ensuring that the interoperability between like chains uh, with different consensus mechanisms and security models and different architectures, uh, it, it could get really, really complicated. And that actually increases the risk and flaws um, for the security aspect of, of the bridges. So um, in terms of like, you know, how you can fix these things, like for smart contracts, obviously there's a lot of auditing that can be done by third parties. I think that's important that, um, Aud audits are you know done consistently just to make sure that you don't have flaws in your smart contract um we talked about the oracles for instance you know work with oracles that are more decentralized that have more nodes uh, i think that move away from centralization and um yeah pretty much 
these are just some of the things. Uh, obviously, user education that continuously needs to happen to teach people about uh, to understand more about how things work. And I think uh, we have a a small group of people who who you know mostly here, for instance, that really understand blockchain. And then you have people who don't even know uh, how to buy you know Bitcoin, so they have no idea what what that is how to even use an exchange so there's such a spectrum of of people around the world that um from basic to advanced there's so much education that still needs to happen and you're looking at universities and programs uh they're so behind on teaching this stuff because blockchain is moving so quickly so that needs to to catch up so that we can uh, educate people faster and better yeah, I totally agree, and uh, I would uh, definitely see that vast majority of hacks are just uh, happening through some social engineering made by hackers, and education would definitely help there in that regard. I'd like to ask Kirillo Yusuf, uh, how does CoinAvatar specifically manage some security concerns of community members? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, for instance, uh, uh, I believe that I mean, almost in every community, there are some investors that are concerned, like whether you've done these or these actions specifically to mitigate some security concerns. Uh, how do you mitigate those? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, as Eric mentioned that, uh, yeah, we, we do constantly uh, audits uh, and uh, yeah, to, to prove our smart contracts uh, to make us better, etc. We also educate our uh, users or community, you know, how, how to do or not to do it, etc. So we also, of course, uh, I would I would also add that uh, this project needs to open a bug, bug bounty campaign yeah, in order to like uh, uh, attract uh, white hackers that they help you in order to find find bugs uh, so you could uh, manage that and um, make your smart contract better, etc. Yeah, so uh, I, I would say that. Uh, so this is how we, we do and uh, try to be much more safer. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick, can you please tell us uh, specifically as you deal with uh, L2s and sort of build a gateway to L2s, uh, what are, like, let's say, once again, security concerns that are being raised all the time? Um, I think one of the biggest security concerns that we've seen so far um, are front-end hacks. Um, you know, there have been a variety of different protocols, like, you know, in the last few years that have, you know, significantly suffered from front-end hacks. And so um, one of the big narratives and I guess initiatives we're pushing is all of the front-ends live on TapTap are stored on Nier's BOS, essentially their nodes or an AWS version of, of, of that. Um, such that, you know, everyone can open source, leave, you know, check out our front ends, um, verify and audit, you know, everything that we're doing. Um, and I guess the intention here is in the future, um, as more and more of our front ends are being used, um, you know, that, that promotes greater security and confidence in, um, you know, the front ends that we're developing. So I think, you know, bridges are also a big pain point for layer twos, um, but ultimately, you know, majority of them have their own security stack. Um, a lot of the, I guess, security auditing companies have a very similar standard and process when it comes to, you know, reviewing front ends or smart contract auditing. Um, but there are ultimately still vulnerabilities. Um, but it's funny, I think the majority of hacks and majority of, uh, um, yeah, so-called hacks really come from social engineering, right? Um, it's, it's never a case for where you're actually losing money because the blockchain is failing. Um, it's because you're clicking on a link and, or it's a phishing link or something and you're giving access to your wallet. So I think generally just people need to be educated on that as we you know, see the next wave of users coming in as well um, and understanding these you know, risks and concerns when it comes to maybe approving or signing messages that um, may look slightly malicious. So um, yeah, ultimately just you know, always be wary um, with the sites you connect your wallet to. Thank you. Sina, I'd like to ask you, since uh, 21st Capital is servicing ultra high net worth individuals and low offices and funds, this, you know, kind of people don't necessarily ape into uh, some meme coins and they take uh, 
this security very seriously. So when they try to mitigate the risks, uh, how do you work with them? So um, <clears throat> essentially, uh, give you a couple examples. Uh, something that we have done a lot recently was to recover funds for folks that had trouble uh, with that after the Samurai Wallet uh, saga. Uh, so when that happened, you know, so many users has funds uh, uh, locked up in, in the Whirlpool or in the wallet. So uh, they reached out to us and we've helped numerous ones totally for free. Um, and uh, actually quite a bit of them uh, left us reviews uh, on Trustpilot that you can check out. But the idea was that, uh, you know, even even users that are kind of more, more educated than average and they're using some uh, better privacy tools, they can suddenly find themselves in trouble because of a little thing or a little detail they have missed. So uh, essentially our team helped with that. In other cases, we see users that, uh, you know, forget a portion of their, their seed and again, reach out to us and, and our team runs uh, algorithms that can recover. If, if uh, it's only a small, a small portion of the seed that's lost, or maybe it's just the order of words, have you been successful doing that? uh but but like the number of issues that can arise are just are just numerous there are so many little things that users need to take into account and especially as we're talking about now working with multiple chains uh little issues and errors happen all the time and uh what we do here is we have a team of experts with uh developers and uh, community educators that have had lots of experience with these different solutions and uh, and uh, they can typically find interesting solutions to to problems uh, sometimes it's a custom approach that they develop themselves sometimes it's a matter of simply uh, changing a work process for a user but I've also been in the education in the bitcoin education space for years now and i can totally see that you know interface and usability and user friendliness definitely needs a lot of work because users get in trouble in numerous ways um so that's what uh, essentially 21st capital right now is trying to address bridging the gap between you know the complexities that that exist uh, in 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 crypto and the difficulties that users have in using them. So, if you'd like any any specific thing as well, let me know. Well, uh, I think uh, let's move because we are a bit run out of time. Let's move to the like the most interesting part of our discussion. Although I'm still wondering about one more thing. What about the regulation? Actually, I haven't to search this part about the cross chain specifically, but I wonder, maybe Sina, you've researched this as well. What happens if uh, there is, uh, let's say, a more regulated chain like Ethereum or Bitcoin uh, as to uh, interact with less regulated and what happens on that intersection? How do, you know, lawyers look at these cases? Uh, can you be more well, specific about that? What, well, uh, I mean, uh, let's say uh, some chains, some networks are uh, being more regulated in some jurisdictions than the other because they've been defined. They have like much uh, bigger capitalizations. And uh, they have to deal with some L2s or just, you know, some other networks that are not regulated at all. So those assets are not being, you know, tracked or recognized as digital assets by the local uh, legislation. Uh, what uh, are there like some, let's say, hypothetical or real challenges in those cases? You mean like when it's rooted through a privacy protocol? For example, yes. Yeah, so um, first of all, it's a very interesting legal landscape that we, we have right now. Uh, 
uh, everyone knows obviously that Bitcoin ETFs were approved and they were they were a big success. Then looks like in the next few days we're gonna have Ethereum um, approved. Uh, so that's uh, <clears throat> that shows an interesting change of attitude by the regulators. Uh, and I also totally see that this will become a election debate and a, and a hot partisan issue. Uh, it, it was for some time moving in the direction of two parties fighting with each other, one supporting crypto and one against. But it now appears that the, the, the against party is trying to switch and uh, be more supportive. If that happens, it can actually be a competition between the two to uh, to pass more crypto uh, friendly regulation, which is a great thing. Uh, but the other side of that is we do see that after Bitcoin ETF approval, they actually got went after uh, anything else in a very strong way, like privacy solutions. Uh, uh, Roger Ver, for example, was arrested for for tax uh, tax form issues ten years ago. Samurai Wallet, obviously, uh, 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 what was it, Uniswap. And uh, even I, I think I heard a couple of weeks back, Robinhood was uh, was, yeah, uh, was served notices for. Yeah, so it, it really feels to me that we are going in a direction of more, you know, regulated uh, channels being uh, approved and anything else being sort of attacked. So uh, if that's the case, uh, the cross chain uh, channels will also be, you know, monitors and scrutinized a lot, especially because tracking uh, transactions across different ch uh, chains is, is much more complicated. Although we've also seen examples where people have tried to move funds between different networks in a way that actually make their, make their privacy less because they left uh, uh, certain patterns. But uh, I totally also see that because this, you know, in increases the difficulty for law enforcement to track the funds, they may not like it. Uh, so, yeah, definitely this will this will actually raise some alarms. Yeah, I can see that coming. Thank you. Also, uh, I want but yeah, Chris, let's go on. Maybe a point to that. On the one hand, the SEC did that with other um, industries before. Typically, what America is doing, if the government is not regulating, then the SEC is suing the biggest members to force regulations. Not because they're against an industry, because they say, hey, currently it's unregulated, we cannot keep it that way. So let's sue the biggest players, because they have the best lawyers, and then they will fight it out in a court. So we get forced regulations because the government is not acting on it and make it uh, very clear. And it seems that's one of the things that we are seeing. They did not sue the smallest um, taxes so they can win fast. They sued the biggest ones so they get clarity. So I don't think that it's a strong move against crypto. It's just that they say, hey, we want to protect the users. We don't know what's happening. So that's you, the biggest one. And then afterwards, at least we have a court um, result that basically has more regulation than it is now. On the other hand, what I think is currently very interesting, it's what's with Mika. In Mika, um, if you read it, they just stay differentiate with the uh, sources of liquidity. So here um, they say that if you are a European entity, if you work with European customers, you should have also um, AML, so anti-money laundering compliant liquidity sources available. And that's a very interesting scenario. It means that in the future, if you are regulated in Europe, that you will want to look for where can you get regulated liquidity that is AML compliant. So you will have decentralized exchanges which guarantee you a sort of AML compliance on the liquidity and others which basically don't care. But that means that um, the big institutional players in Europe potentially cannot use these as liquidity sources. And I think that's a very interesting argument. Um, like Mika is coming into effect basically next month, but it needs to be ratified in the countries 
So it will take still up to two years until we actually see the results. But I think that's a very interesting movement into the regulation in the space community. That is indeed. I never thought this way, especially about the CE. C S E C that you said, and actually it makes sense now to me. Previously, I thought that they just don't notice smaller players, but <laughs> that wouldn't be right. Thank you. Uh, now let's move to the most uh, entertaining and most speculative part of our spaces session. Let's talk about the future of blockchain ecosystem, the future of cross-chain technology, and how it will shape the blockchain landscape in the coming years. Uh, I would like uh, Chris to provide some comments on this and then we'll go to other speakers. Um, like for the future, it will definitely be extremely interesting. Um, the, the key thing is like how we exchange value in the future, how we transfer value in the future. If you see in emerging countries um, where the benefits of the blockchain are much higher than in the uh, like Western countries, which have a highly developed um, um, banking system, that there the adoption also is much higher on how the user base is interacting um, with the chain itself. Especially as, um, if I can point it out, um, an AI will never own a bank account but an AI can own a wallet. So you will see autonomous actors that completely are separated from any person, from any entity that will start acting in the financial ecosystem with their own accounts and uh, trading and acting with their own accounts. And that will be a very interesting future of how to automate like the blockchain ecosystem. For all of this to work, we need to drastically simplify accessibility on liquidity throughout all the chains. Basically, um, you currently, it's a, it's like a, 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 like a duct tape kind of system, how we connect all of the systems all together. And there's no simple and streamlined way to access liquidity in all the corners. And I believe that this is our biggest and most important challenge in the future, to make it easy and simple to reach every corner, beside of um, making the systems um, institutional ready so that institutions out of Europe, out of the US can easily access um, all of these assets, all of the systems in the corner. And then we will have a very magic system which will grow pretty fast throughout the world because then we reach the point where blockchain will become simpler than traditional finance. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, Kirill, I'd like to ask you, have you been thinking uh, what improvements uh, happening in the future to cross-chain interactions could uh, have, uh, you know, um, bring some adoption and uh, actual improvement to the user experience? Yeah, so from my point of view, that should be appear some major players uh, which will do like uh, this connection between all the chains. Uh, since all the chains are uh, different, they like silos, they have like they have standards, their uh, consensus mechanism, etc. Yeah, so there we, we will have like some project, I don't know what project solution, which will like unify all of this in, in one place. So it will like be a, a hub uh, which will help to connect, to communicate these blockchains, etc. So also some sort of standardization will appear in this field uh, so that the other project can, from the beginning, to apply to the, when they develop their blockchain, for example, etc. So yeah, so this, I think this is how it will be. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick, can you tell us specifically uh, what uh, is being developed by uh, not necessarily layer tools, but overall to make more convenient uh, uh, cross-chain interactions. Hmm. I think um, I think it's also it's it's good question. I think it's hard. It's an attention game, right? There's a there's a lot of layer twos, either optimistic or zk rollups, and then yeah, again you have these communities that are divided against one another. Of course, there are certain multi-chain users, but I think largely. Um, the people who are airdrop farming for a specific chain typically, you know, drive a lot of activity. TGE comes out, activity declines, and then you kind of have this, 
you know, this network that, you know, at first may have had a lot of activity and transactions, but now it's like, hey, you know, what what do they do now? You know, sort of how do they drive attention back and incentivize users to actually stay on this, this certain layer too? So I think ultimately that's that's a big problem that many of them are facing. Um, you know, we see ZK Sync um, that's being heavily farmed, you know, Blast, um, Scroll and Linea are starting to announce their campaigns. I know that Linea now has just announced a, a surge campaign that's going to last for the next six months where they aim to try and reach $3 billion in TBL. Scrolls also announced sort of their point system with marks. So I think ultimately it's also this idea of like points, badges, gamification, and, um, you know, how, how best to, as much as we, uh, you know, how best to like track activity. Yeah, of course we want to track activity and incentivize the users who are loyal, but of course we don't want Sybil participants. And I'm sure you've probably seen a bunch of things on layer zero um, with, you know, um, I'm removing a lot of these wallets that may have overformed or had bots, um, you know, producing transactions. So it is, it is a really difficult space. I think the nature of the industry now is becoming increasingly more complex and more competitive. I think hopefully we start to see, um, you know, certain layer twos get swallowed out by one another. This will still take some time, you know, next two, three years. But, um, I think it, we're reaching that point to where it's, it's it's gonna become a decide yeah a more decisive space as to like what you know what specific networks should be used and should be valued at you know certain x market cap or x billion market cap and I think you know a lot of the times there are you know VCs come in that that get better deals and and whatnot so I think ultimately we'll see a lot of this diluted space you know really consolidate hopefully into into you know, maybe still 10 networks versus 100 networks, right? Or 20 networks versus 200 networks. Um, you still see a variety of different layer twos coming out. It's like, it's really, really funny. Um, and, you know, everyone's trying to attract TVL and it's all a TVL game and attention game. So it's a difficult space out there, I would say. So you believe that these uh, cycles already going to be decisive and uh, actually... Uh decide the fate of the market like which networks stay and which don't no i i just i, I would hope i would hope so um <laughs> i think we'll see a variety of the core layer ones still stay uh i think there's obviously some layer twos that will get weeded out you know let's let's give an example of um like let's say there's like a, a large web 2 gaming company based in like southeast asia that is trying to bring on board, um, you know, web two games to web three, something like this, where then they're coming on, um, and, and trying to, you know, say, use conduit or use other services to build a layer two, then they're trying to compete in TVL with like, you know, all these multi uh, hundred million dollar to billion dollar layer twos. And it's like, what's the point? Why not just work with an established foundation versus trying to build your own roll up? Um, I, and I think we'll see many such cases as this until people realize that, it's not necessary um, unless unless it makes sense, you know, unless it really does make sense. But I, I just think people are doing the roll up as a service or roll up as a product um, for the sake of it to attract TVL for the time being. But um, yeah. Thank you for your comments, Nick. Uh, Eric, you are operating at the most backend level of us all, I believe. So may perhaps, you know, some, you know, mysterious facts and insights so tell us how do you see, where does it all go perhaps you know all this cross-chain inter interoperability and uh, what developments we should expect in this cycle or next ones yeah thank you um i think a lot of projects currently uh, layer ones um you know some layer twos are all part of an ecosystem so um, the ecosystem itself, I think, is the key. Um, right now, because interoperability is still such a challenge, uh, everyone's kind of racing to create their own ecosystem so that uh, there's real use cases and it's kind of a one-stop shop kind of thing right now. And uh, when once interoperability is figured out, then 
as soon as there's an influx of other users into their ecosystem, it's ready to go. So I, I, I do see a race towards a, a solid kind of a usable ecosystem. Uh, like, for instance, Deeper Network, we're building uh, infrastructure, which allows a lot of dApps to be built. So with the infrastructure, uh, people could come in and, and build dApps right now and be able to access 175,000 nodes around the world. Uh, for instance, IP marketplaces. Uh, we have that kind of built. Uh, we have the decentralized Oracle. We're, we're working on a decentralized uh, cloud storage system. So, so that once you're in this ecosystem, you have access to all these things, um, Web, Web3 oriented, so that they're all kind of owners of the network. Um, in terms of like what we can do to foster a more collaborative environment, um, I think we all need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of different blockchains. And once we start realizing that and uh, I, I forgot who was speaking earlier and they mentioned instead of building your own to utilize the strengths and um, each other's strengths so that we can collaborate and work together to build a stronger bridge, uh, bridge the ecosystem, like uh, to basically combining, um, you know, two ecosystems or three ecosystems together. And I think a lot of people don't also realize that, you know, we're heading towards a future where uh, it doesn't really matter what network you're on and that there's going to be uh, multiple networks. It's but they're not even going to realize that once this is all done and said and done, it's going to be uh, smooth. And once uh, one transaction is one action and it may be crosses three or four different networks and, it, you know, gets the job done. And so right now, everyone's, you know, fans of this chain and that chain eventually all that is not really going to matter and um it's going to be a combination of multiple chains uh, the the focus should be mass adoption about education and learning obviously for the project itself they're trying to do the best for the project and making sure that you know it survives but in terms of investors and, and understanding this uh this whole ecosystem as a whole uh, that's the kind of direction we're heading towards Thank you so much for your insights. And also, I would like to thank all our speakers for wonderful insights and for helping us to do this Spaces event together. Uh, before we'll be wrapping up this event, I'd like uh, all uh, to ask our audience to uh, raise your hands if you have some questions or request speaker permission, and we'll have a round of uh, questions from audience. Uh, Let's let's give it a few seconds. If people would like to grab a mic, we'll give them such opportunity. Uh, if not, then I'd like to thank everyone again. That's been a wonderful insight. Uh, let's not forget to follow each other's profiles. And we also uh, run these Spaces events regularly and we'll be happy to see you again very soon. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, pleasure learning from all of you. Likewise. Okay, so there we have it. A big chair, a big um, panel on all of this cross-chain stuff. What do you think about it? It directly relates to deeper networks. So that, that is why Eric Ma was there, and it, it basically is all about getting the tasks for N NPOW, which is obviously the next step for us. Um, and also how tasks and tokens and basically the whole blockchain space can go in between different places, touch each other in a good way. And um, kind of, it's going to be the future of blockchain where tasks and NPOW and proof of work can all interact with each other. Projects can use other projects on different chains to complete tasks. It's going to be really cool um so i hope you enjoyed that it's i mean obviously it's not my work but uh yeah it's uh it was insightful when the solana chain has obviously migrated over that is what deeper is going to be driving towards please remember you can use the code deeper not at checkout to get an extra five percent off the deeper shop and it will help support the channel and support me blah blah, blah. and um yeah so this was really good I've never heard of these guys before. Obviously, Eric Marv heard I've heard of, um, but 
the people who were in this are pretty big players and I kind of hope that there's already agreements in the background to kind of get the ball rolling with deeper network and using their 175,000 nodes to um, complete these tasks. If you haven't already, please go on to my website and create a free account. I'd really appreciate it. Gets the account count up and um, might help the website to be seen by more, more uh, potential nodes. And that's pretty much it. Please don't forget to like and subscribe so you get more videos like this in the future. And ring the little bell so you get notified of all upcoming releases. And that is it. So have a nice weekend and I will see you on Sunday for the update. Bye bye.